one um, one final thing. I actually was one slide short of where I wanted to stop and forgot. It's one final thing I wanted to say about uh, this last section, and that is that the maximally unbalanced file corresponds to having two equally sized files. We had the Thorpe Shuffle where you drop either the left the bottom left card and then the bottom right card, or you drop the bottom right card and then the bottom left card. So maximally unbalanced Feistel, in other words, where you have one bit that's sort of hanging off the side, gives us two equally sized piles and you randomize the relative ordering of one card from each pile. If you were to then move to a slightly less unbalanced Feistel where you now have two bits on the left, this corresponds to having four piles, these piles now named by the you know, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. You have four piles, and you would end up uh, randomizing the relative order of one card from each of those piles, and so on. So you can you can think about uh, Feistel as it becomes, you know, um, from maximally unbalanced up to balanced. So in, in the case of balanced, you would have uh, mm -hmm. n over two piles, and you would randomize the relative order of one card from each of those piles. So you can, in, in every case, you get something that corresponds to a shuffle. Okay, so let's take a step back here for a second. Remember that the, the, the motivation for this whole first part of the talk was this problem of how do you encipher credit card numbers in place? And we started out by saying like, okay, let's say first I wanna take a block cipher and I wanna you know reduce its size. Uh, to, and, and we saw how to do it if you wanna um, reduce the size of the block cipher just a little bit, how to do it if you want to reduce it a lot. And we had this difficult uh, piece in the middle, and this was an example of that. And we said, like, okay, if you wanted to turn uh, uh, all the 16 decimal digit strings, uh, you wanted a block cipher that could operate on them, then you'd have to take log two, and that would give you roughly somewhere between 53 and 54 bits. Uh, so you needed to build a 54-bit block cipher out of, say, AES, and we um, looked at some some really cool ways to achieve that and in particular to achieve that with security bounds uh that give you um, security as an sprp up to roughly two to the 54 queries but we can take a step back and ask the question if we wanted to encipher decimal digit strings did we actually need to turn them into bit strings anyway what if we could just make a cipher sort of naturally operates on decimal digit strings. In particular, this is interesting because when we when we converted from decimal digit strings into bit strings, we had to have some some waste, right? Because we, we had to have enough bits that we could cover all the possible uh, decimal digit strings. And so you can end up in the situation where you have to cycle walk. Uh, you know, maybe it's two, maybe it's four, but you, you're going to have to do some cycle walking. And so there's some ways to it. So we can ask the question, like, what if we could just encipher more or less directly on the, the blue domain, the, the, the native domain that we care about, instead of mapping from the native domain into some associated domain and then and then doing the ciphering there. So this is what we're going to do now is show how to do this. This is this is called integer Feistel. So this is one round of integer Feistel for six digit decimal strings. So this is just one example here. Um, the only difference between this and the normal Feistel that you're used to looking at is, is effectively uh, the inputs and outputs of the round function. And instead of using XOR here, you use symbol-wise addition mod 10. So instead of doing symbol-wise addition mod 2, which is what XOR is over bit strings, we're going to do symbol-wise addition mod 10. That's really the only difference between integer Feistel and normal bit string related uh, uh, bit, bit string Feistel. The round function here obviously needs to map from uh, from decimal strings of some length. And in this case, it needs to map them down to three um, digit decimal strings. So here's an example. You take the right half, of course, and you copy it down to the left half. And then you take the left half and you do the symbol wise addition mod 10 with the string here. And if I've done this properly, 107 uh, symbol wise, uh, addition mod 10 with 0 to 2 gives you 1 to 9. So this would be the output of one round of integer Feistel. And this, if you repeated this, would then naturally give you a Feistel that operates directly on six decimal digit strings. And we'll see why six is of interest uh, in a moment. How do you build these round functions? Lots of ways to do it. But one uh, fairly simple way to do it is, you know, we, we, we want to replace this with uh, 
we, we want this to be a good PRF, basically, right? We don't need this to be invertible, as we know for Feistel, this doesn't need to be an invertible function. So we'd like to say, okay, I could replace this with a with a random function. So it makes sense to start with a good variable input length PRF uh, construction. For example, AES CBC Mac. So you can declare this round function on some number, some number string n. So in this case, it's six five five. To be, you take that number string, you convert it into a bit string. You run it through your variable input length PRF construction, which in this case I'm saying is AES CBC Mac. You take the resulting output of this. Well, if this is you know 128 bits. Then this is 128 bits, and so you have to truncate this down. You truncate this down so that you have bits that you can convert back into a three-digit number afterwards. So what you need then is to take three-digit numbers can be at most. There's, there's a thousand of them, right? Zero, zero, zero up to nine, nine, nine. So you take the output of CBC Mac, you take log of 1,000 and take the ceiling of that to give you the number of bits that you need come out of this. Uh, and then you take that bit string, you convert it back into a decimal digit string and you take the result mod 1,000 to make sure that you stay in, in the right range. That's one quite simple way to build an appropriate round function for this integer Feistel construction. Uh, a couple of notes on this. So you can prove SPRP security for this construction up to the same bound that we were seeing before, this uh, capital N to the one minus one over R. Um, if you have six R minus one rounds, this is a really nice result from Maurer and Pietrzek and also from uh, Huang and Rogge. In this case, n is not two to the little n, it's actually 10 to the little n. It's, it's the, the, the radix, if you will, of, of um, like it's a function. So you get SPRP security up to almost the entire domain, again, uh, for six R rounds, where R is this parameter here. So this, the closer you make this to being the full domain, the more rounds you need, that should be intuitive. It's also easy to make this into a tweakable integer Feistel um, by, you can throw the tweak into this round function naturally because, um, in fact, this is one reason for using a variable input length PRF as the round function, is that if I wanted to um, throw in stuff here that was beyond just the, the, the number that's passed in. So for example, if I wanted to pass in as well, the round number that I'm in, so that helps me to get domain separation across uh, across rounds. You can throw that in there as well. So you can turn this this cipher into a tweakable cipher. Um, and maybe I should even ask, like, does everybody know what a tweakable block cipher is? Hands up if you know what a tweakable block cipher is. Okay, a few people. So for those of you who didn't raise your hand, a tweakable block cipher you can think of as being a block cipher with an extra input called the tweak, uh, and the tweak is um, you know how the, the the key, the secret key for a block cipher, once you plug in the key, you get a fixed permutation, right? A tweakable block cipher is you you plug in the key and now what you have is actually a family of, fermi of permutations that are named by that key, one permutation for each tweak. So the tweak, a tweakable block cipher basically gives you a way to get like, for the cost of one key setup, you get a family of, of permutations to work with as opposed to one permutation to work with. And this is handy in, in lots of applications. And we'll see um, one application of why you might want to have a tweakable version of integer Feistel in just a minute. OK, in particular, let's look at encrypting credit card numbers, proper credit card numbers, not just decimal digit strings. So if you take uh, cre credit cards are, are between, I believe, it's 16 and 20 decimal digits. Typically, we use 16. Um, and they're, they're organized in the following way. So the first uh, block of blue digits up here are what are called the major industry identifier and the issuer identification number. So if you have a card from um, uh, Visa, I think Visas all start with three MasterCards, uh, or like five, one, five, two, five, three, and so on. So depending on the card issue, you get a different number up front. And depending on the industry, let's say, um, a credit card, like a proper credit card versus like a gift card or some other sort of uh, card that you might get. All, all of that is encoded in this upper block of light blue things up here. The block of yellow that's here, this is the account number that's associated to the card that was issued uh, by this block, uh, by the, the, the part identified in this blue block. This is the account number. It's not really account number per se, It's it's more like, a string that is uh, uniquely associated to the account number of the cardholder. 
the very last digit is called the LUN digit. It's just a checksum of all the preceding digits. So it's fully determined by, by the first 15 digits. Well, okay, so you probably, although this starts to feel somewhat antiquated at this point, but if you can remember life before uh, near field, you know, uh, Apple Pay and uh, uh, Google Pay and whatever, you would get a credit card a receipt to sign and the last four digits typically of the credit card number were shown, It'd be like XXXXX and then the last four, right? So those, those are typically stored in the clear at point of sale. The, all of the, the top six digits are also stored in the clear for various processing and clearing house reasons. So really it's only these six digits in the middle that actually need to be encrypted. This is why I gave the example of a six digit integer Feistel a moment ago because now you can take these six digits here and that becomes the input for your integer Feistel. And here you can actually uh, throw in this tweak where the tweak is the blue sections of the card here. So in the end, what you get is the stuff that was stored in the clear is still there in the clear and you've actually enciphered the middle section here. Can you think of why you'd want to include uh, all the stuff in the blue, which is listed in the, the clear anyway, why you'd want to include that as a tweak Imagine you didn't have that as tweak. You just had just straight integer Feistel. What's one possibility? It's one thing that could go wrong. I don't know if wrong is the right word, but one potential security. Um, yeah. Different issuers with the same account number in some sense. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You could end up with two cards that had different issuers uh, and different last fours that had the same the same cyber block in the middle. So to avoid that, you can work in all the stuff as a tweak. And so now you're you're almost certainly going to have it be the case that even if you have the same account number, you'll end up with a different encrypted section in the middle. Um, uh, if possible, I just have a question. Uh, does the yeah. checksum number when it's encrypted still have to be like, does it just still have to be, does it have to be check up? Like does the loon number, does it correspond to the it doesn't, cyber? It doesn't have to be, no, it doesn't have to be. You You, you could make it so that it does and in fact, and, uh, something we'll say later would give you the ability to do that. It doesn't have to be no. It just it doesn't have to be the case that you can actually process this encrypted credit card number. You just have to store it as a credit card number because, for example, that's what the database field requires. So we, if you actually were to then use this, you could then decrypt the middle section, and then of course the one digit would check. Okay. So uh, yeah. So this is encrypting credit card numbers. So now we've finished these two big chunks here. We've, we've looked at how do we turn a MBIT PRP into various different kinds of um, PRPs of different sizes. We've seen that how to build a PRP with a native domain of, uh, of this. And I, you know, I should point out that of course, um, uh, you, know, you get these good security bounds. Um, so all, all the stuff that, that we looked at in terms of like Markov chain or yeah, Markov chain analysis, coupling analysis and all that, it, 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 all, it all works here too. Um, and this this paper by Wong and Ragaway does a really nice job of looking at um, a variety of different kinds of Feistels. So whether they be bit string based Feistel, um, balanced versus various degrees of unbalanced integer versions, uh, alternating Feistel ciphers, they go through and they work out uh, all, all the results uh, for all these kinds of ciphers. So it's a it's a really nice paper. Okay, so now on to the next thing. How do we build a PRP with an arbitrary finite domain? So now that we have this integer cipher, so we have the ability to take an integer and produce another integer out of it. Um, we can think about now, um, we, we have this thing that maps from basically uh, Z sub N where N is the, the number um, of possible numbers you can have given a, um, a particular size of integer Feistel. We now can think about this. What if I have an arbitrary set uh, calligraphic X, an arbitrary set of objects, and the number of those objects is at most N, so that I could enumerate all the objects in the set, giving each of them a number between zero and capital N minus one. Moreover, let's say that I had an invertible mapping that allowed me to go from a point X in the set of arbitrary objects. Think of these as being like, I don't know, uh, street addresses or quotes from books or whatever. I could map from, from this domain into the integers. I can run my integer Feistel to get another point. And the, the dotted blue line here is the image of the set inside of, of uh, 
integers mod n. I can map the thing I care about to an integer and cipher it using integer feistel. And if that mapping is avertible, now I can go back to an element of the set. And what this now gives me is the ability to build a block cipher, if you will, over an arbitrary collection of objects, w whatever they are. <laughs> It doesn't matter. They could be, I don't know, they could be Python programs. They could be really anything, as long as you can enumerate them. And there aren't more than capital N of the things in the set. And you have some vertical mapping between the objects you care about and the integers. You can now, using the tools that we have, build a cipher on this arbitrary collection of objects. To me, that's pretty cool. The dotted blue line. Um, uh, you know, I said that the set of objects had to be, uh, could not be any larger than n. It could be smaller, of course, so if you have an integer Feistel uh, and you don't want to mess with it and the collection of objects that you want to, 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 uh, to encipher with it happens to be, you know, half the size or something, then this dotted blue line is uh, going to have, you know, it's going to be properly included inside of this sort of mustard yellow uh, um, sphere or oval here. And so what are you going to do if you, say, get a point here and you bounce out outside of this dotted blue line? You cycle walk until you end up back in it. And once you're in it, now you run your invertible mapping and go back over again. So the same same tricks that we've already learned you can use here. This is precisely format preserving encryption. You start with some format of objects, you encrypt it properly. It should be called enciphering, but we call it encrypting. You, you take this these formatted objects you had here. You map them to integers, and you come back to it. This gives you a way now to build an enciphering scheme that that preserves the formats of the input object. In some ways, the block cipher is already uh, kind of a trivial format preserving encryption object, right? Because it takes in a bit string of a certain length and it outputs a bit string of a certain length. So the format, if you will, of the input, which is a bit string of some length, is preserved. So it's a very simple case of that. This is a generalization where what, whatever this collection of objects is, whatever is the, the format of those objects, it's preserved via this process. So we know how to do the integer Feistel. We know how to cycle walk. Uh, we certainly know how to enumerate things. So the only part here that's potentially a little bit tricky is figuring out this invertible mapping between the domain you care about and the integers. And in particular, how do you do it so that this mapping is efficient? Because what you wouldn't want to have happen is I have an efficient way to implement integer Feistel. Uh, I want to build something that gives me a cipher over, I don't know, telephone numbers or street addresses or whatever. If this mapping was really inefficient, well, then the whole enciphering process becomes really inefficient. So what we want is an invertible mapping, and in particular, an efficient invertible mapping. So this, um, this takes me to uh, what looks like it's coming out of nowhere, this, uh, this matter of how do you rank strings in a regular language? So I'm, I'm going to assume that everyone here knows what a regular language is. It means you know you can um, you can represent the the set, which is the language, by a regular expression or a non-deterministic finite automata or deterministic finite automata. Um, and the languages of those are all regular. In fact, every finite uh, set is a is a regular language. So um, this really uh, th this is one of those moments when. Um, I, I, I just really like these kind of things. So the the this this slide where I'm talking about ranking a regular language, it means like finding an order uh, for the strings that are in this regular language. This actually was um, uh, first worked out in a completely different context in the 80s. This was in the context of figuring out what is the optimal compression of a regular language. And this ranking that I'm about to describe that was shown to, to be the optimal compression of a regular language. And then um, in 2009, uh, Blari, was it Blari, Rogaway, Stegers, and Ristenbart, I believe. That's not the right order, Blari, Rogaway, Blari, Ristenbart, Rogaway, Stegers. Uh, in 2009, had the first paper on FPE and rolled in this, this result from this completely other context um, uh, for, for, for serving the purposes of building this efficient invertible mapping. So let me let me explain how it works. You have some regular language, uh, language of some regular expression R, and there's some point X sub I that's, that's in this language. Now I want you to imagine you take all the strings in this language and you order them lexicographically, okay? You order them. Then the, the rank of string X sub I is I. It's the ith string in this ordering. 
Uh, I guess it's actually the Eiffel's one string in this order if you start from zero. But it's the, the, the rank is basically the index of the string if you've indexed them appropriately. So the ranking means you take a string and you give me back its position in the lexicographic ordering. And then you unrank, if you give me a position in the ordering, unrank gives you the string at that position, rank and unrank. So ranking is the inverse of rank and uh, unranking is the inverse of rank and vice versa. So you have an invertible mapping, but in particular, if you give me the, the DFA, the, the deterministic finite automata for this regular language, then there are efficient algorithms called rank and unrank that do exactly what you want. And that if you pre-compute some tables, ranking and unranking are, are linear in the length of the string. So if you have a, you know, a, a string that's got 100 characters in it, then ranking that string is, is linear in 100. Likewise, unranking is going to be linear in 100. So it's, it's very efficient. So this gives us what we're going to call regular expression-based FPE. You're building a cipher now that takes in a key and maps from the language of a regular expression into the language of the regular expression by simply uh, you take any set that you can describe via a, a regular expression. You run rank on a, on a point that's in that set. It gives you an integer. You now run integer Feistel, do some cycle walking if you if you absolutely need to, and then you unrank back to get a string in that regular language. Is that clear? Cool. Okay. Uh, so how does this work? Yeah, was there a question? No, no. Just what to say it was clear. Okay. So how how does this work? I told you these things exist, but how does it work? The the key observation here is that if you if you take a, a, a finite automata, a DFA, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between strings that are in the language and accepting paths through the DFA. Right. So here's a very simple DFA here. This is your start state, Q0. This is your only accept state, Q2. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between strings that are in the language and the labelings of paths between the start state and the accept state. That's the, the key observation here. So here's how ranking works. The first thing is you, you establish an ordering over the alphabet of the DFA. Um, so for example, if your DFA, in this particular case, you have only two symbols in the alphabet, A and B, and you just declare that the ordering of these is A is less than B. And then you extend this lexicographical ordering of symbols to strings, doing it one symbol at a time. And then the third step is that you order the, the accepting paths of this DFA based on this lexicographical ordering of strings. So for example, the strings in the language are going to be the, the, the labels of all the accepting paths in this DFA. The smallest such path is AB, so AB. Then the next one is AAB, right? Now, there is another path that's of length three, which is ABB, but lexicographically, AAB is less than ABB. So you can make an ordering, um, lexicographical ordering, based on, on the accepting paths. And the rank of a particular string, this is the, the mathematical way to describe it, so let's talk through it. The rank of X is equal to the size of the following set. This is, um, if you looked at all the strings in the language that are of the same length as X, and yet are lexicographically less than X, that gives you the rank of X among all the strings of the same length as X. So then to get its overall rank in the whole language, you then add to that the size of that set. So this is all of the strings that are accepting but are less than X. You add to that all of the strings that are accepting whose length is less than X. Since lexicographically, strings that are shorter will come in the order before strings of, of X's length. You add those in. And then you also add in all the strings of the same length that are less than X. That's the rank. That's how you find the rank. Okay, so um, I told you that if, if you, if you pre-compute some tables, then uh, you can do ranking and unranking in time that's linear in the length of the string. I'm just going to very quickly show you the table here. So the, t the table you pre-compute pre has as its rows the DFA states, and as its columns, the length of paths. And what goes in, for example, this position here, this table T at row Q1, column 2, 
is the number of accepting paths if you started from Q1 and went two steps. Okay, one more time. This position here is if you start at DFA state Q1 and you went two steps, how many paths, accepting paths are there that would start there and go two steps? So obviously if you wanna know how many of length zero there are, well, there's only one accepting path of length zero given a particular starting position. And that's if you start in the accepting state, well, then a path of length zero is still accepting. But the rest of them, there are no paths of length zero that accept from other states. And you just fill in this table until you get um, this entire collection of results here. This is the pre-computation that's required. The thing I want to note, and this will come up again later, is that the size of this table is linear in the number of states, the DFA. It's also linear in the, in the, the, the length of the paths you care about, but this is going to be the one that's most important. The pre-computed table, its size is linear in the number of states in the DFA. Come back to that, you'll see why it's important. Um, maybe I'll just do a real quick run through here of, of, of how ranking works, just to give you some idea. Um, so, okay, so, so this algorithm rank here, it gives you the, the, the rank among all strings of the same length as its input. So you, you start out by initializing, you say, okay, I'm gonna start at the start state um, and n is the length of my string. And so from, from i goes from one to n, I'm gonna do the following things. So down here at the bottom, we're gonna rank the three symbol string a, b, b. So we're gonna call x1 is a, x2 is b, and x3 is b. N is the length of the string, that's three. We're currently in the start state and the, the rank so far is zero. All right, so we drop into this for loop for each position in the string. So we're at the first position at the moment, we're in the, the for loop we've just come in, so i is equal to one. Then we're gonna say, okay, for each symbol um, in the ordering over symbols that's less than the symbol I'm currently looking at. Well, the symbol I'm currently looking at is A. There are no symbols that are less than A. So I can just skip this loop entirely. And what you do is you then move forward. You say, okay, given the state I'm in, which is the start state, if I consume that first character, I'm gonna move to the state. So I'm in Q0, I consume the A, I move to Q1. So we update Q to be Q1. And now we just repeat this loop. So we move to the next character. Next character is a B, okay? For each symbol in the ordering over symbols that's less than B, well, there's one of those and that's A, I drop into this loop and I pull out of my pre-computed table here, I'm gonna increase the rank of my string by the number of strings of length one less, since we've already consumed the first character of length uh, one less, that start with a smaller symbol. And we looked that up in the table, this is precisely why we built it because we moved to this state and so now we're asking, okay, how many paths of length one are there? We started out with a string that was of size of size three. So now we're looking at um, how many are there that would get us to the accepting state from here. And we just read that straight out of the table. So now the candidate rank so far is one. We move forward. So now we've moved to state Q2. We go back to the top and we repeat for the last symbol, which is B, which of course we do the same thing as we did a moment ago, because there is one character that's less than B, which is A. So when we get to this part of the loop, we drop it here and we look and see, okay, how many would there be? Um, did I get that right? Yes, how many How many would there be if we, were to move, if we were to consume that B and move forward? How many strings would there be? And there'd be none because we'd be in the state Q3 and you never get to leave that when you're there. So then this gives us that the rank of, of the string ABB among strings of length three is one. So in other words, there's one string of length three that's less than ABB. And we already know what that is. That would be AAB. So we did get the right, the right ranking among strings of that length. How do we find the number of strings that are accepting that are of length less than three? We actually can read that straight out of this table too. You just look at all the path lengths that are less than three. If you started from the start state, how many strings are there? Well, there's only one of any length that's less than three that's accepting. So we add one to it. That gives you the whole overall rank of X or of, of the string ABB. If that was too quick, that's fine. I think the slides will be available or you can go and look at the, the BRRS um, uh, paper on FP. It describes this as well. Okay, so then this brings us to what's referred to as the rank encrypt unrank FPE construction. So um, see this is one annoying thing about Zoom is the little windows are covering up the 
size of my slide in my view. So this thing takes in uh, a key, which you need for the integer cipher, which you need for like the integer Feistel. You need a, um, a uh, your plain text comes in and you're, you're, because you're doing format preserving encryption, this plain text is in the language of the regular expression that you have in mind. You take your regex and you feed that in as well. So you've got three inputs, key, plain text, and regular expression. Notice that no matter how, like syntactically now, if you threw away all the stuff inside of here, this is now an object that takes in a key and a plain text, which is what we're used to seeing for encryption schemes. It's just got one extra input now, and that's the regular expression. And the guarantee is that the output will be a cipher text that's also in that language. Right? And this is what we've been seeing along. It's like you start with a credit card number, you map to an integer, you encipher the integer, and you map back to a credit card number. Right? So you're guaranteed that the cipher text ends up being in the same language as the plain text was, no matter what the language was, no matter what regular expression you used. The actual processing inside, though, as I was saying, is that the regular expression, you have to convert it to a DFA because that's what ranking requires is a DFA for the expression. And we'll see why that's the case. That DFA then is passed into both rank and unrank. You take the plain text, you rank it. So you take your string from the regular expression, you turn it into a number, that's its rank. You run integer uh, Feistel over that number to get another number. And then you unrank that number to get back into the language. This is a way to build, this is the rank encrypt unrank FPE construction. Okay. But I said a moment ago, we have to turn the regular expression into a DFA uh, because that's what these two things need. But you know, why, why not rank directly from the regular expression instead of converting it to a DFA first? Well, the reason brings us to what I'm gonna call format transforming encryption. So we had format preserving encryption. Now we have format transforming encryption, which is loosely speaking going to be you have two regular expressions, one that describes the format of the input, one that describes the format that you care about on the output, and you can actually transform things of one type, say credit card numbers as plain text into things of another type, say street addresses. But the street address is a ciphertext for the credit card number. Now you can start to play all kinds of crazy games for this stuff, right? So, okay, so we saw earlier this problem of how to do uh, in-place encryption of credit card numbers. Now I wanna talk about the other problem, the seemingly unrelated problem of how to circumvent nation state uh, censorship, in particular um, that use DPAC and inspection devices. So as I said, the thing that sort of ties these two disparate uh, use cases together is the fact that traditional encryption is, is really ill-suited for either of these tasks, in particular because natively we think of, of encryption or, or, or enciphering as taking in bit strings, not weird things like 16 decimal digit strings, which you would need for credit card numbers. And the traditional ciphertext, the traditional security goal for encryption schemes is that the ciphertext should be like indistinguishable from random bits and not something like a well-formatted HTTP message or a credit card number or whatever. So traditional encryption is ill-suited Ill for these, these tasks. So format transforming encryption is, is very much like FPE, format preserving encryption, except now instead of having a single format, you have two formats. So you have a format, a format formally speaking is just a set. In what we described so far, that set is, is compactly described by a regular expression. Um, you've got a plain text format, which you can think of kind of like as, as helper, helper information in the case of the rank encrypt unrank uh, FPE construction. The, the plain text format you needed because that gave you an optimal way to compress. Um, and then you needed to be able to, to decompress that basically uh, to get something that's back in the language again. So the guarantee again of FTE, just like FPE, it's, it's just like traditional encryption with this extra operational requirement that the ciphertexts that come out have to abide by whatever, they have to be a, an element of the set that's described by your ciphertext format. So we're gonna see how to build these things see how we can use them to circumvent uh, deep packet inspection devices. And then we're gonna get into some of the operational things like, um, you know, if these are sets and if you, uh, you want, typically you want that the ciphertext set, for example, is very large, right? To, to avoid, you know, being able to do things like frequency analysis or, or brute force kinds of attacks. So you want a big set of possible outputs. If you think about like even a simple block cipher, Right, the output set is of size two to the 128, right? 
it's huge even for just for for a simple primitive like that well you're not going if you wanted to pass in as if you wanted to say my ciphertext is one of these two to the 128 possible strings you're not going to list that have a list of those strings you need some compact representation in order to be able to to make this whole construction here be kind of efficient so that's something we're going to run into too it's like how, how do you actually make these things um, compactly representable notice that that the flexibility here is kind of baked into the syntax of the system because you can keep the plain text format the same so say your plain text format is credit card numbers so you have some some regular expression say that allows you to optimally compress that regular language down so that you can then run your integer five store. But by changing the ciphertext format, if you plug in here, um, you know, a format for street addresses, then the ciphertext for those credit card numbers will be street addresses. But just by changing only the ciphertext format to be, I don't know, quotes from the Bible, now you're making ciphertexts from credit card numbers that are quotes from the Bible. And all you needed to do was change that one input. You didn't have to build an entirely new system. So it's kind of cool that you can do that. Okay, so let's consider the censorship circumvention setting. So here's the idea. Um, <clears throat> you are wanting to do all the kinds of stuff you typically do on the web anyway. So you want to maybe watch a YouTube video, you want to surf the web, you want to go to Twitter, whatever. You want to do all these sorts of operations that you kind of take for granted when, when you're using the internet. But you want to hide them, right? Because you're concerned that um, your activities online might be being surveilled or censored or whatever. And you could, for example, just use a traditional encryption scheme here and encrypt every packet. But then what you'd get is a TCP IP packet whose payload um, is you know, random bytes. And if you have a deep packet inspection device that's, say, only allowing through messages whose payloads um, are from a collection of recognized protocols. So if the payload, it has to be either HTTP or DNS or FTP or whatever, it has to be one of those in order to be passed. Otherwise it's gonna be labeled as, as um, a suspect and either dropped on the floor or you know passed on for some sort of um, um, activity. Uh, I'll put in protective quotes. Um, you, you, then you wouldn't want to be the case that your payload is just random bytes because that itself becomes a tell that you're using encryption. So you must be trying to hide something. So what you'd like to be able to do instead is take your plain text traffic, your plain text things that you're looking for um, or watching or whatever, and have those be encrypted into something that is going to pass the DPI device. It's going to look like a valid HTTP message, for example. So, okay, so in this setting, we, you know, the input to FTE is going to be, you know, they're, they're going to be, it's bit strings or byte strings, however you want to look at it, but there isn't a lot of structure that we want to necessarily um, uh, assert on the plain text because we'd like to be able to handle traffic of all different kinds. So we'll just say that the, the plain text format is just zero one star, in which case we can sort of just focus on the simpler API where we just get rid of the plain text uh, format altogether. For now, we'll come back to it. So we're just gonna focus on the simpler API. So now it's like you take in arbitrary bit strings and you wanna encrypt them under the secret key uh, and have the output be an element of this ciphertext format set, whatever the target is. So here was uh, our, our goal when we, we wrote this first paper on, F, on FTE um, was we wanted to cause, we wanted to show that you could cause real DPI systems to reliably misclassify your plain text traffic. So in this case, let's say you have HTTP where you're doing, uh, you know, whatever, you're doing uh, searches for some potentially blacklisted uh, keywords. If you put in an FTP format, for, for our, our FTE system. Then what comes out of here should be a ciphertext payload, encrypted payload, that when run through this DPI box would say, yes, this is an FTP message. Even though what actually went in was an HTTP message, the DPI box says it's F, uh, F, FTP. Okay, so this is misclassification, misclassifying HTTP as FTP. This is the goal. This is the goal, right? We wanna cause it to be able to basically say anything that we want. So in particular, the goal is truly, we want to be able to misclassify our plain text traffic as whatever protocol we want. We want to make this DPI box dance to whatever tune we decide. And of course, we want to be able to do it with good throughputs so that you can actually watch streaming videos and whatnot, low latency, all that kind of stuff. So here's what we wondered at first was like, how, how do these real DPI devices actually determine to what protocol message belongs in the first place? So 
we, we managed to couple together uh, this, this collection of DPI systems. Um, some of them are, are open source and, you know, freely available, like, you know, Bro, for example, um, which I think is now called Seek. Uh, so we were able to get this collection of DPI uh, tools. Um, these are all free. This end probe uh, cost a bit. This DPI X, I'm just going to call it DPI X. This is an actual DPI um, device from a well known company. You know, think along the lines of like a Cisco or a Blue Code or whatever, some well known uh, company. This was a, a, an expensive enterprise grade DPI box. And we managed to get access to this through some back channel because, as you might imagine, uh, as a professor, you can't just call up, say, Blue Coat and say, I'd like to buy one of your DPI boxes. First of all, because they want to sell in volume. Um, they're not interested in selling one box. And they're really also interested in making, they make their money on the back end, which is all the service and the setup and the maintenance of these boxes. But in any case, they don't want to sell you one box. And they for sure don't want to sell a box to some nosy professor who they know is probably going to try to figure out what their box does and how to break it. So in any case, we, we were able to get a hold of one of these and we sort of tore them apart. We, um, in, for the, the open source things, we could tear them apart and figure out what they were doing uh, to classify traffic. For, the, for DPIX, we had to kind of infer it. And what we found was pretty consistent. Regular expressions, regular expressions, uh, even like Bro does regular expression triage and then applies some heuristic um, uh, parsing that happens after that. Same thing with this end probe. It's a commercial thing, but we were still able to figure out that most of what it was doing, even though they were heuristics, were still could be captured by regular expression. In the DPI box, it wasn't clear, but it seemed, you know, based on this trend, that it was likely that there were regular expressions were being used in this um, uh, super fancy DPI box. As why would we care about um, using a regular expression here to describe the format of the output. Well, for example, let's say that you know the regular expression that's going to be used. Um, you know the regular expression that if you match it, causes you to be flagged as suspicious. Well, and then what you could do, for example, is take that regular expression and take the complement of that the language of that regular expression and use that as your ciphertext uh, format. And now what you're guaranteed is you'll get ciphertext that will not match the regular expression that would cause you to be flagged as suspect, right? So this is, you know, a simple example of why knowing that these DPI boxes use regular expressions is useful for uh, for building these regular expression-based FDE schemes. Okay, so how should we realize this? Um, of course, we want cryptographic protection for the plain text. The way we're going to realize this FTE is we're going to start by um, just decrypting our plain text as normal, so using some authenticated encryption scheme. And you remember. From the previous slides, we talked about how to rank a regular language. Since we're talking about regular expressions, no surprise, we're going to use this ranking of regular languages again. This is how we're going to realize regular expression based FTE. So you encrypt your plain text using some off the shelf authenticated encryption scheme. You're going to get out here now. So, say if you're using like uh, counter mode, some sort of counter mode based uh, AE scheme. Well, you know, counter mode, if you uh, start with a good um, uh, PRP or PRF, uh, as, uh, then you're going to get uh, a ciphertext that's indistinguishable from random bits. So we can take this intermediate ciphertext and interpret this string of random bits as the base two representation of an integer. We take the regular expression, we turn it into a DFA, we pass it to unrank, and now the integer that's represented by this random bit string that came out of encryption gets unranked into the language. This is a random bit string, which means we get a random integer, which means we get a random element of the language of the regular expression. This is how you build regular expression-based FTE. So now, of course, all you need are good regular expressions, right, for the situation you have in mind. So um, in the cases where we had those, those DPI uh, devices that were open source, you can just extract the regular expressions directly. In some cases, um, you can tweak those or just build them um, uh, de novo by hand, by looking at RFCs for, for protocols and whatnot, and, and the DPI source when, when it's available. Um, you could actually even just learn them from the traffic. So if you could watch inputs and outputs of a DPI device and see which ones pass through and which ones don't, you can then learn from this uh, via a number of, of classical learning techniques. You can learn regular expressions that describe um, the um, 
yeah, you basically learn the right construction that's inside the DPI box by seeing out input output pairs. Okay, so here was our use case we had in mind was actually browsing the web through an FTE powered tunnel. And we'll say that FTE wins in this use case, if the DPI device classifies the stream that it sees, so the stream that's coming on the wire here, as the target protocol that we want it to say it is. So we ran some tests. Uh, we developed regular expressions for HTTP, SSH, SMB, I forget what else, FTP, DNS, a couple of other things. Um, these were our target formats. So these are the things we wanted our HTTP traffic to look like. Took the output of the FTE client, we, we ran it through the, the DPI box. Of course, in actual use, the client goes to some proxy on the other side of the DPI device. It gets decrypted, and then the actual plain text traffic is what goes out to the internet. The results come back, it gets re FTE encrypted and goes the other way. Um, and so, what we ran here was we, we ran this test. We said, okay, for each of these possible target formats, we visited each of the Alexa top 50 websites five times. And we just kept score of how often we could get the FT, the DPI box to classify our HTTP traffic as these targets. And what we found, the punchline is that we could make the, these DPI devices, these are real DPI, real DPI tools. We can make them say whatever we wanted basically 100% of the time. 100% of the time. Whatever the input protocol stream was, we could make the DPI device say it was whatever we wanted it to say. So we actually ran a field test with this. My, um, my graduate student at the time um, managed to, to, um, to get some, uh, to buy some time um, on a, a virtual uh, server inside of China and spun up the, uh, our, our FTE client inside of China. And then we had the proxy was back in the States. Um, we wanted to see like, you know, how, how does this thing actually work in the field? So before we turn the FTE tunnel on, uh, we tried going to Facebook, YouTube, Tor, tried searching for banned search queries, all those things got blocked as expected. And we expected to see that because, you know, prior work had already looked at the kinds of things that uh, got blocked. So we saw exactly what we expected to see without the tunnel in place. And then we turned the tunnel on and did the same things. We did this for months, every five minutes for a month, did all these things that we knew would be blocked if we weren't using FTE, and we we never saw um, we never saw any uh, any case where any of our connections were dropped or any any sort of like indirect signals that our traffic was being flagged. Um, we actually we we to bootstrap this. We turned on the FTE tunnel and we went then to the Tor website to download Tor, so that we could then run Tor from inside China through our our, our FTE tunnel. If you ran tour without it, then we saw this active blacklisting um, where there's like um, active probing on the handshake uh, uh, to determine whether or not the client inside of China is trying to talk to a, a tour um, node. So we saw that without the FT tunnel turn on, and once we turned it on, we didn't we didn't see any problems at all. So you were able to run tour through this FTE tunnel and do things like you know stream videos. So that, that was pretty cool. We did this for a month. Uh, at the end of the month, we shut it down. Not for no other reason than uh, you know, we ran out of money, <laughs> we ran out of time on the on the server. So that was pretty cool to see it actually working. Now I don't want to make too big a deal out of this, right? Because this is kind of a needle in a haystack sort of thing. It's like if if the the, the Chinese uh, censorship infrastructure didn't know to look for FTE, well then you know that might be one reason why uh, uh, it, it wasn't flagged. But this was successful enough that that uh, that that FTE actually became part of the Tor browser bundle. Um, uh, for a time, I think it, it might have been deprecated now in favor of something else that had a higher throughput, but it was actually part of the, the Tor browser bundle at one point. Okay, so FTE, cool. We're able to turn arbitrary plain text into ciphertext that have formats that, that we get to pick. Uh, well, what about just using FTE for in place encryption of credit card uh, numbers? And so, you know, here, so the, the plain text now do have a particular format to them. Um, we have a regular expression for the credit card numbers. This this isn't quite handled by the the simpler API that we've been considering, where you you have um, you know just the ciphertext format. In particular, because um, well, if we're using this construction here, right, you have bit strings need to go into encryption. If you take a valid sixteen uh, decimal digit number in, well, you should also get a valid uh, sixteen decimal digit number out, which tells you that the plain text language and the ciphertext language are the same size, which is good. 
Well, because conventional encryption takes in bit strings, we have to convert this thing into a bit string, which means you're going to end up expanding the effective plain text space as we already saw. Um, moreover, like conventional encryption has ciphertext stretch, right? For the IV or if you're using an AE scheme, you have a tag that's part of it, so you get some stretch. So now what you've done is you've started with, you, you have a, a plain text and a ciphertext format that are the same. So you're using FTE to uh, induce FPE. So the ciphertext language and the plaintext language are the same size, but in the process of converting plaintext into ciphertext, you expand when you convert to bit strings, and then you expand again when you do the encryption process. And what you end up with is a situation where you can have actually an exponential number of outputs of encryption that can't be unranked because they actually fall outside of the range of numbers that can be unranked because what can be unranked are the possible uh, 10 to the 16 strings uh, that, that are in the, the, the plain text language. So we need something here. And really all we need to do is return back to the full API, which is where we have a plain text format and a ciphertext format. Um, because now what we can do is, as I said, this original idea of, of uh, ranking a regular language um, was to provide optimal compression for a regular language. So now we have to extend what we had before, I mean, I'll back up one slide, two slides here. This was the construction before, encrypt, unrank. Now we're going to do rank, encrypt, unrank. And the reason for this is so that when the plain text comes in and it's in the, the language of your input regular expression, R1, this provides optimal compression of the strings of that language. And th so you basically like, whereas before we were expanding before we encrypted, now we're, we're, we're expanding as little as possible. Um, so you rank using the DFA that is associated to the input regular expression. And then you unrank using the DFA that's associated to the output regular expression. And in the middle you do, you do encryption. This is a generalization of the, of the technique from the FPE setting. Okay, so this has tons of potential for sure. The question of course is, um, all right, if you actually wanted to use such a system, this is you know very flexible, right? You plug in two regular expressions, and you plug in. You don't even have to plug in the encryption scheme. It could just you know it, it could be something that you get off the shelf. Um, you plug in these two regular expressions, and you're supposed to get these guarantees that you're converting plain text of one type into ciphertext of another type, and these two things don't have to be you know related structurally in any way. Uh, other than, it has to be the case that the size the number of plain text that you can put in can't be more than the number of ciphertext that you get out. That's pretty obvious as soon as you say it, because if, if you had more plain text than ciphertext, then you couldn't decrypt uniquely every ciphertext, right? So here's already like the first question. If you wanted, if you wanted to use this thing, if you're a developer, not necessarily like a, even a, uh, you're not a cryptographer or even like an expert computer scientist, you have these two variable expressions. How do you even know if you can use them together? Right? How, do, how do you know in general that the language of your input regular expression is no larger than the language of your output regular expression? In general, this is not, not easy to determine. Um, other questions like, should your encryption scheme that's sort of in the middle here, should it be deterministic, like the ciphers we looked at? Or can I use you know, traditional encryption, like some sort of counter mode based AE scheme that has stronger security properties where can, you know, which of these should I use? Which of these can I use? Um, and maybe maybe most importantly is, will the two regular expressions that I have, will they both admit time and space efficient implementations of ranking and unranking? And we need that to be the case, right? Because ranking is going to run on the language of regular expression one. Unranking is running on the language of regular expression two. We need both of these to be both time and space efficient in order to have an overall system that's time and space efficient. Okay. So let's look at just the unranking part, the output here. So we have this process, right? You, you put in a regular expression and this gets converted to a DFA. Well, the typical process, if you recall from your theory of comp, your you know, basic theory of computation class is there's a process that goes regular expression to NFA, non-deterministic finite automata. And then from there to DFA, right? That's the, the standard process for doing this. And in fact, there are libraries for doing this. For some regular expressions, this works out fine. You start with a regular expression, you convert it to an NFA. The NFA almost always has roughly the same size in terms of the number of states in the NFA um, as, as 
you know, there's, there's a relationship between the size of the right of expression in terms of the number of symbols and the size of the NFA in terms of the number of states. And for some regular expressions, you can then go from the NFA to the DFA and keep the number of states the same or close to the same. But I want you to remember this slide where I showed you the pre-computed pre table for doing uh, ranking and unranking this pre-computation. And I stressed at that point that the size of this table was linear in the number of states in the DFA. Well, there are certain, actually certain quite simple regular expressions that themselves have compact representations. So the NFAs likewise are, are small and have a few states. But when you convert from NFA to DFA, you actually get an exponential blow up in the number of states. Like I think we had one regular expression that was like, it's like thir 13 kilobytes long that resulted in a DFA that had, was it like 270,000 states or something like this? So you get a huge blow up for certain regular expressions. And that's bad because in order to do unranking efficiently, in order to do unranking in linear time, you need to pre-compute a table whose size is linear in the number of states in the DFA. So an exponential blow up in the number of states results in an exponentially large table, which then makes the system a non-starter, in particular if you want to implement it in you know, uh, some third world nation where computing devices are not as powerful as we have. You want to be able to, to make it so that you can use this um, on all sorts of devices and all sorts of settings. So we had to figure out like, okay, can, can, we, can we combat this? So what we wanted really was not to convert regular expressions to NFAs, or to DFAs, sorry. We'd like to stop just at the NFA step if possible. We wanted to have efficient ranking and unranking from the NFA as opposed to the DFA to save this uh, table size blow up issue. The problem is that you could show that ranking or unranking from NFAs or directly from a regular expression is actually P-space complete. So this appears that we're just dead in the water with this approach, but maybe not quite. So let me revisit for a moment Remember we had this ranking picture for ranking the language of, uh, if you go from a DFA and it, I showed it as like one step. It was like, you had this blob, which was the language of the regular expression, which is this blob over here. And we went straight into the numbers by ranking them. But really what we were doing was not that directly. Really what we were doing was a two-step process, which was we had this nice one-to-one -one correspondence between strings in the language and accepting paths through the DFA. So really what was happening under the hood there was we had a one-to-one -one mapping from the objects we care about, which are strings of the language, and an intermediate representation of those things, which is a path through the DFA. And it's actually the paths through the DFA that are ranked. So it's actually a two-step process. Okay. So, you know, you, 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 you rank your path, and then you would perform your integer, Feistel, your deterministic encryption, on those numbers, and then you bounce out, you know, back to the intermediate representation and then back to a string in the language. All right, okay, that's what I'm showing here. It's basically, I'm showing both sides of it. Regular expression, string, intermediate representation, which is a path, rank it, encrypt that number to get a different number, unrank that back into a path, and a path you didn't then read off the characters on that path to get the string. All right, what if we try to do this two-step process with an NFA? And here we're going to get to the heart of why this thing is P-space complete. Now, in an NFA, remember in an NFA, you can have epsilon transitions, meaning you can transition from one state to another by consuming no symbols whatsoever. You can also have parallel transitions out of a state. Right? You can have multiple transitions with the same edge label. And so the result is that for any string that's in the language, there could be lots of accepting paths. And that means that the size of the intermediate representation set can be much, much bigger, exponentially bigger than the size of the language you actually care about. So even if you can rank here, this is, this is the problem is like, you end up with this huge blow up in the size of the intermediate representation. So the, the reason that this composite ranking process when you, when you pull it apart into its two actual steps, the reason that it's hard, the reason it becomes P-space complete is, is mostly because this first step of figuring out how do I go from a language to a path is hard. And in particular, the, the, um, the original ranking algorithm, which ranked from the language looked like anyway, directly into the integers, was required to be invertible on the entire 
intermediate representation set. It's required to be invertible as a mapping from the language of the regular expression to the integers. And it assumed, moreover, that the size of the intermediate representation set was the same as the size of the language, which you get if you're using a, a DFA. So, okay, that's, that's the real holdup. That's why it's P-space complete to try to rank from an NFA. So we said, okay, maybe we could step back and we, we could relax a little bit what ranking means. So instead of requiring that you can, that you're invertible on the entire uh, intermediate representation set. Instead, what we'll do is we'll, 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 we'll split this in the following way. First thing we need is we'll, we'll, an injective mapping that we'll just call map that takes you from the language of the right expression into the intermediate representations and that's injective. So there's some image here of this set inside the intermediate representations. We need that um, uh, to get into the intermediate representations. And we'll assume that we have efficient ways to go from the intermediate representation to a number, which we do. Um, but then when you wanna go backwards, when you wanna unrank, you're gonna need a, a, a surjective mapping from the intermediate representations back into the language. And you know this surjective on this can look sloppy because it's like we could have many points in here that map back to the same value. And indeed that's the case if you're doing an NFA, you have lots of paths that correspond to the same string. But the restriction we make on these two mappings, map and unmap, is that it's, it is one-to-one um, -one on this set. It's one-to-one -one on the image of the language under map. So we've relaxed the requirement from being one-to-one -one on the entirety of the intermediate representation to being one-to-one -one just on the image under map of the, the regular expression. This turns out to be enough, this relaxed ranking technique. If you think about, okay, so how, how is one gonna implement this? Well, to do this, you think about like how it is that um, you determine um, whether or not an NFA, a string is accepted by an NFA. And the way you would do this is, so this is the standard NFA syntax. You have a, a machine M, which is an NFA. It has a set of states. It has some alphabet as a transition function, a start state, and a set of um, final states or accepting states, if you will. This is the standard NFA syntax. And the way that you determine whether or not a string is in the language of an NFA is you keep these, um, we'll call them, they're typically just called frontier sets, but we're gonna call them forward frontier sets for reasons that will become clear in just a second. You start out with an initial frontier set, which just contains the start state. And then for, for uh, indices K uh, greater than zero, you keep a, a set, which is, so um, calligraphic F sub one is gonna be all of the states that are reachable from the start state by consuming the first symbol, right? So you keep this set of possible places you could go by reading the first symbol. And then F sub two is going to be all of the states that could be reached starting from any of those states, reading the second symbol and so on. This is your frontier. You're keeping basically all of the possible paths that you could be following by reading the, the, the input string. And you accept if and only if you've read the entire string and you look at the set of states that you have that are potentials, if the intersection of all those states with the set of accepting states that are part of the syntax is non-empty. Say that again. If the frontier of possible states that you have after you've read the whole string contains at least one state, which is an accepting state, then you know that among all the paths that are that are um, contained in the sequence of frontiers, among those paths, there's at least one path that goes from the start state to an accepting state. That's a typical way in which you determine uh, whether or not a string is in the language of an NFA without going to, to converting to a, a DFA first. Well, that's okay. This this is this procedure is good. This allows you to make a decision, but it doesn't make it easy to actually recover any particular accepting path. And that's what we're actually going to need because we need to know the path in order to be able to figure out what the string is that goes with it. So in addition to these forward frontier sets, we're also going to keep backwards frontier sets. So you start now sort of from the back end, you start by saying, okay, backward set sub n, b sub n is the set of accepting states to start with. And then you roll backwards and you say, okay, if I were uh, uh, b sub n minus one is going to be all the states that could have reached one of the accepting states by reading the last symbol in the string. You keep these things going backwards. Well, then you can look at the boundary at any at any position in the, in the string as you're consuming it. You can look at the boundary and say, if I came forward reading the string, so I read symbols uh, c1, c2 up through ck, 
And if I were to start at the end of the string and read backwards from an accepting state, so here I'm reading um, like basically in verse like, you know, C sub n, C sub n minus one and so on. If I look at the intersection of these two things, these two sets, the forward going ones and the backward coming ones at any place, this will tell me the set of states that are reachable from the start by reading the first K symbols, such that if you went from any of those states and read the remaining symbols, you'd end in an accepting state. And just by keeping track now of these S sub Ks, I know precisely which are the paths that would allow me to get from start to finish. And so we can now define, based on these sets, we can define the map. So the, the injective mapping from the language into the intermediate representations. Basically what we're doing is we're trying to establish among all of the paths through the NFA that this string could have followed to be accepted. We basically need like a canonical representation. We need one path. Because if from among all of those paths, we can canonically recognize one, then we can basically just ignore all the rest of them. And we're back in the game of trying now to have, we have a one-to-one -one, again, correspondence between strings in the language and paths, right? So that's what we're doing is we're saying, oh, we're gonna assert that the mapping, so this magenta colored arrow here is determined by the path through these boundary states. So forward, intersect, backwards, first uh, at the zeroth time, at the first time and so on. The path through these states with the lexicographically smallest string if you read the symbols on the edges. That's gonna be map. That's gonna how we're gonna find our, our canonical representative of all paths for a particular string. And then unmap is easy. You just take the path that you have and you read off the symbols, right? So unmap is easy. It was map that required some work to get to. Once we had that, now we could do relaxed ranking. So you, you, you map from your original thing to your canonical representative, and then you just use the normal ranking on, uh, on the uh, whole intermediate representation to get the rank of the particular path that you've chosen. More generally, so this picture is colorful, maybe a little confusing. More generally, you have to remember, we had not one regular expression, but two. We had the regular expression that described the plain text space, and we had the regular expression that described the cipher text space. So we have to kind of do this twice. So we have a map function for regular expression one. We have a map and an, and a, a, an unmap for regular expression one, which describes how do we go from a plain text string to a canonical representation in the NFA. Then we rank that. So the overall ranking procedure for some string X is you first map it to get a, a representative path, and then you rank that path to get to here. And you encrypt on your on your your integers, and now you need to unrank. But you unrank under the un the unmap for the second regular expression, and then out. Hopefully, that's that's clear enough after uh, this much um, um, discussion about it. The range of numbers that you have to accommodate now, before we only had to accommodate things that were related to one regular expression, but now we need to, the range is the max of the sizes of the, the, the two languages. That's the range of integers over which we need to be able to encipher. Uh, how should you do this? How should you do this encryption part? Well, it depends. So if you are um, using a uh, like an integer cipher, I mean, it's not necessarily the case that the sizes of these two um, uh, sets of, of intermediate uh, representations are the same. And the position, I've sort of drawn them maybe misleadingly to the position of the image set, the set that you can actually unmap out of, doesn't necessarily have to have the, you know, the same size as this or, or be in sort of the same position in the, in the sets. So you're probably going to have to do some cycle walking if you're, if you're, using a, a deterministic encryption now you'll do cycle walking if you're using a randomized encryption if you want to use like off the shelf you know some counter mode based um, aad construction to do the encryption then you would do basically like rejection sampling so you would do your map you'd rank and then you would run your your authenticated encryption scheme on this to get a cipher text and then you would just check is this value here if i turn it uh, um, back into a path is it actually in the set of things that I can unmap? If not, I'll just re-encrypt with different randomness. So you're basically doing a rejection sampling based on the set of things you can unmap out of. But either way, we have techniques for being able to make sure that you can actually encrypt and decrypt out of one language into another language. 
we built what well, we, I, I didn't build it. I'm old, I don't write code. Um, my student at the time uh, built a really nice library called libfte, which you can go and get from this address, it implements all this stuff. Um, it was, at the time, it was part of Tor. It's also picked up by some other censorship circumvention um, uh, projects. Um, and we, we provided with it this configuration assistant, which was aimed at trying to help developers figure out, like, I have these two real expressions. Can I use them? Um, you know, are the sizes appropriate, whatever. So you can put in um, an input regular expression, an output regular expression, and some operational restrictions, like I, I'm going to be using an off-the-shelf um, you know, implementation of counter mode based uh, authenticated encryption scheme. You can provide these things, and then this tool will tell you either error, like you can't put these things together in the way that you want, or it gives you a list of, of, of predefined FTE schemes that we built and we put together um, that do satisfy the constraints that you've given with some statistics on the amount of memory that's required, the running time, and, and that kind of stuff. One more challenge to tackle, which I think, yeah, nine, 13, yes, I have a few few more um, few more minutes. Uh, I think a few more minutes, right, John Paul? I go, to, I go to half past, right? Yeah, yeah, you go to the time. Okay, good, okay. So I do, I do wanna address one, one more thing, um, and that is, if you look at this overall construction, here, this encryption step. So imagine that you're using, uh, you know, a good a good PRP or uh, you know a good integer Feistel you can show as a good you know a good PRP, uh, or you're using, you know, some counter mode based uh, AE scheme. Then you know that what you're going to get here are basically uniform random bits, which corresponds to a uniform integer in some range. Which means when you unrank, you're going to get a uniform ciphertext from that set. Well, if you imagine that your your set of things you want to output are say uh, HTTP messages. Some HTTP messages, even though they're allowed by the by the RFC by the spec, are really uncommon. Right, you would almost never see them in deployment. And yet, if you're outputting a uniform element of that set, then the really unlikely in practice ones are just as likely to appear on the wire as the likely in practice ones. And that too may provide a tell to DPI boxes like. Yeah, this this is a message that I would never expect to see in real use. I'm seeing it, so therefore this has probably been produced by this system. So really, what we want to do is not just provide um, a a set as a format, but actually a distribution over a set is what we want. Now, if this and so I've changed the names here from from rank and unrank into plain text translation, which I'm going to sweep under the rug. It's fairly simple things you might need to do. And I'm going to change a particular unrank into now encode. Excuse me. So we get these uniform random bits here. And if the distribution over possible outputs itself, the one you're targeting, is uniform, then it's easy. Right? You can just do what we've done so far. But what do you do if the distribution you want to match is not uniform? So another way of saying this is, if I give you uniform bits with which to sample from a distribution, how do I sample from a non-uniform distribution using uniform bits, in particular, in a way that allows me to recover from that sample what those uniform bits were? There's lots of ways to sample from non-uniform distributions with uniform bits, projection sampling, important sampling, these kinds of things, but they don't give you um, guaranteed ability to recover the uniform bits that you use to sample. And we have to be able to do that. Why? Because the uniform bits that we're using to sample are the output of the intermediate encryption process. And we need to be able to decrypt that in order to get the plain text back. So we need, a, we need something more than traditional sampling techniques. We needed a way to be able to recover the uniform bits that we sampled with. And you know, not only that, but like, what do you do if the number of ciphertexts is, uh, is, is not a power of two, right? I I've, I've, I've clearly can enumerate a power of two number of ciphertexts given the uniform bits that I have. What do you do if the number of ciphertexts is not a power of two? And what do you do if the distribution is not uniform? So this is the next thing we had to tackle. The short answer to the story is you do something simple like, um, uh, you do like arithmetic, so you know arithmetic encoding is, is a way of, uh, of encoding stuff, of compressing things down. Um, and arithmetic encoding is particularly nice um, because of its properties that what you actually do is, is the encode step, which replaced unrank, 
is actually implement, implemented by the decoding process of an arithmetic encoding scheme. So essentially you treat uh, the, the, the bits that come out of encryption as a code word, if you will, and you decode those into a sample uh, from this distribution. It works beautifully. You, you, there's some systems that you, you have to take care of about finite precision and whatnot. But this gives you a way to encode the bits that you have into a sample from the distribution that you care about in a way that has very high fidelity to that distribution and also allows you then to run the encoder on the other side to recover the, 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 the bits that you use to do the sampling in the first place. It's really pretty cool. Um, yeah, this is, I can skip this. This isn't uh, terribly important. Okay, so um, we know how to, how to, uh, how to um, do regular expression based F, uh, FP and FTE. And um, we know how to, how to do this distribution matching, which means we can not only do like regular expressions, we can also do kind of like um, randomized regular expressions. Well, randomized regular expressions, the regular expression converts down to a DFA. You throw some probabilities on the edge weights of a DFA, you get a Markov chain. So a Markov chain gives you a compact way to describe a, a, a format for a regular, for a probabilistic regular expression, if you will, right? Turns out, given the techniques that we developed for, for ranking from NFAs, that also gives us, um, with some slight modifications, a, a way for having your format not be described by a regular expression, but by a context-free grammar, which is a richer language. Right? It allows you to do things like make ciphertexts that are valid C programs, which if you think about that for a second is pretty cool. Uh, in fact, we can do this now. We we can produce uh, valid C that will actually compile and, and run. They'll give you garbage if you run them. But this sort of is like elevating the amount of work that you'd have to do if you wanted to detect the fact that the C program that you're looking at is, in fact, a ciphertext of something. Or you'd actually have to compile it and run it to see that it was an error instead of just like looking at the C at the source code or even going through the step of just compiling and not running it. You still wouldn't be able to tell that way. So we can do using the techniques that we develop for NFAs. We can also do now um, not just context-free grammars, but probabilistic context-free grammars. And the reason that we needed the, the tricks from NFAs for that is because many context-free grammars are ambiguous, meaning there are potentially many parse trees for any particular string in the language. So again, you need a way to be able to uniquely identify like a canonical parse tree for a string. But what do you do if you want to, for example, um, turn your plain text into images or sound files or natural language text? Well, if you take natural language text, for example, the typical thing we do is you throw some you know, machine learning tool at it. You learn a model, some generative model of some, you know, uh, it's been trained up by some, some corpus of, of, of text. Well, we now have a way to be able to take a generative model of say natural language text and use the model as the compact encoding of the, uh, of the format. Like the model itself, by virtue of the fact that it's generative, provides a compact way to encode um, a, a huge variety of possible natural language text to output. Um, we don't, we may not know precisely what that encoding is, right? Because that would require you to be able to look inside of your your um, your CNN or whatever RNN and figure out like, okay, well, which does each of, what does each of these nodes actually do? We don't know precisely how that thing is encoding this huge uh, uh, collection of possible natural language ciphertext output, but they're all there. And so now we, we have a system that can actually do that so we can take things and turn it into, you know, uh, whatever the plain text was and turn it into say natural language or Im excuse me, images or sound files or whatever, which gives you now lots of different ways to, to be able to hide uh, your information, so. Anyway, that's the story of format transforming encryption as an offshoot of FPE, and that's it for me. Thank you. Yeah, we have some questions. Uh, hi. Uh, it seems to me that there is no room for improvement in the encryption that is enciphering part of the FTE. Is that correct? So there are no open problems or anything like that? Um, that well, there, there are. There are some open problems. Um, 
but they're becoming like, um, you know, as the case is in any new field, they become like smaller and smaller open problems that are harder and harder to solve. So I showed you um, one kind of shuffling based uh, Feistel scheme, the, the Thorpe shuffle one. That was the first one. Since then, there have been a, a, a slew of these swap or not, sometimes recurse, uh, icicle, um, I forget. And what, what these things have done is, is um, they've, they've you know, explored the trade-offs between the number of queries against which you can remain secure versus the number of rounds that are required. And so there is still room for improvement in those constructions. It's, it's not known at this point. I think the, the fastest one works in expected logarithmic time um, and provides you security, I think, up to the entire domain. Not, not like a significant fraction, but the entire domain. And it remains open, I believe, whether or not you can achieve that now with, with expected uh, logarithmic, but with like worst case logarithmic. That's one of the problems that remains open. So there are still some room for improvements there, and people are still actively working in this area. I will say another, another area that I didn't touch on at all here is the fact that I said at the beginning that um, FPE was a, you know, a, a many billion dollar a year business at this point because um, uh, in the um, early 2000s, I guess, the legislation started to be developed for uh, protecting uh, credit card numbers, and, and it was requiring point of sale terminals, for example, to encrypt credit card numbers in place, and for those credit card numbers to be transmitted encrypted um, through, the, through the financial processing chain. Um, and so um, there are standardized, so NIST standardized a collection of FPE schemes that are closely related, for example, to the integer five to one that we saw. But I believe it's the case, and if uh, uh, Stefano is still there, you can ask him, because he I think has one of the most recent papers on this, I believe it's the case that all of the standardized FPE schemes are broken or can be broken. The step goes around asking, asking about this because he'll be able to say it. So, so that's another whole area is that like, we know how to build them in theory with really, really strong security guarantees. But the standardized versions that people have made are all broken or almost all of them are broken. So. There's a gap there too. There's a lot of improvement to be made in actually getting standardized a scheme that it isn't broken. Uh, and this is not trivial because um, part of what the, of course, the standardization process, what they want is as fast as possible, right? You know, this this thing, it's like, well, you know, you you, you want security, but you're never going to, you know, trade security if it means that you're, you become super slow. So the parameter choices and the particular constructions that were chosen were, were chosen it's like, yeah, you started with this provably secure construction. Now we're going to tweak the parameters and maybe slightly the way it works, and we're going to standardize that and hope for the best. So there's still that's another area where it's open is to actually like come up with very efficient constructions that are standardizable uh, that aren't yeah. broken. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one was. Uh, at least in the first hour or the first uh, session where you talked about uh, methods to uh, like focusing on a, a, a tiny domain uh, PRPs from say 128 bit PRPs. Uh, so, uh, and finally, when you came to uh, mapping, you know, uh, encrypting arbitrary domains, so you sort of used the uh, integer Feistel as a core component. Uh, but uh, right. I feel like even there, you're focusing on plain text with uh, sm with a small space, like small size. So I was wondering how do, uh, if you want to encrypt like a large message, then you use modes of operation. Then is it somehow trivial if you use like integer Feistel ciphers in a counter mode, do you get security or? Um, uh. I think the answer is probably yes if you use a tweakable integer Feistel. Right? You, because there are very simple constructions that look an awful lot like ECB mode, in fact, where you replace the block cipher with a tweakable block cipher, and the tweak becomes basically like the um, the uh, the position in the, in the ECB crypt. Um, there are very simple schemes over tweakable ciphers that do give you provable security. So I believe it's the case that if you did 
that using a tweaked integer Feistel with enough rounds to give you a good tweakable PRP, yes, I believe that would, would give you a way to do this. Okay. It's a good and, question. Uh, and the last question is, uh, at least on this slide, so it seems that you have a works in submission where you use machine learned models as your ciphertext format. Uh, so I also uh, came across a talk. Uh, essentially, they, uh, I think it was by Matt Green and few few other authors. Like yeah, the media capture. paper. Oh yeah, so they use something like yeah. steganography. So uh, it somehow f these two works seem a bit similar, or are they? Like, what's the connection? They they are they are. So uh, on on the face of it, so okay. So here here's here's the deal. This slide was actually made about five years ago, six years ago maybe. Uh, at the time, this was the only scheme that did this. And man, this paper just kept getting rejected. And it was getting rejected because it was like, um, you'd have the cryptographers would review it and say, well, you haven't shown me any provable security. You didn't give me even a security notion for what it would mean for a steganographic scheme, uh, uh, which this really is if you, if you cast it the right way. Like, a, like, you didn't prove to me that this thing was secure. Well, the reason for that is because there isn't a security notion even to start with for this kind of a thing that describes security for it. So, of course, we didn't prove it's secure, and we did what everybody else in the, the security world does, the non-crypto non security world, which is you, you run experiments and you, you run, you know, uh, um, empirical tests that show that the distribution of outputs are within some distance of some, you know, some reference distribution or whatever. So we had like cryptographers who would complain, you didn't give me, you know, enough provable security, like real proofs. And then we had systems people who would say, well, okay, you talked about how you would, you know, uh, 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 map messages from one type to another, but you didn't explain the whole system that I could deploy. You didn't explain, for example, how I'm going to do steganographic key exchange or parameter negotiation or any number of other things. So people just kept hating on this paper, <laughs> either because it wasn't doing enough provable stuff or it wasn't doing enough system stuff. Instead, what we were trying to do was show like, look, here's the thing that does a really cool, you know, provides a really cool service. And we've thought through a bunch of the systems issues for this particular piece of it, because there are a lot of them. For example, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to the meteor thing in just a moment. Um, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of systems issues. Um, let's say, for example, when you use a generative model, um, uh, GPT-2, for example, what, so you provide this thing a seed, uh, which is, you know, a, a string of, you know, of characters, and based upon that seed, it proposed this to you, here's a distribution for the next token output, and that distribution, um, it may include a token, which is the letter T, a token, which is the composite TH, a token, which is the composite T-H-E, and a token, which is the composite T-H-E-S-E. -E. Those are all possible tokens. It could be output from this distribution. Now, you can sample from that using the, the techniques I described with arithmetic encoding. But then on the receiver side, how do you know how to parse that? Do you parse it as a T, as a T-H, as a T-H-E, as a or T-H-E-S-E? -E? So what you get is you have non, you, you have, um, non-prefix, uh, you don't have prefix-free strings come out. So you have to come up with some like, you know, clever parsing strategy on the receiver side. This is one of the systems issues you have to deal with. There are lots of other ones. Um, and so we attend to all these system things and this is really the big difference. So this, this paper, our paper was first, but it kept getting rejected uh, with increasingly better comments. And then at some point, I think it was last year, the Meteor paper appeared, which did something that was pretty similar to what we were doing, except didn't attend to the systems details that we were attending to that actually needed to be attended to in order to build a component of a system. Um, and so now, yeah, it's in submission again, but now, it's, as you point out, what we're getting now uh, from reviewers is like, hey, what about the, this Meteor paper that appears to do kind of the same thing? So it's like, ugh, we were getting rejected before for, for what felt like silly reasons. And now we're getting rejected because somebody else has planted a flag in the area where we were already working. So yes, it is the case that the media paper does something similar to what we do, um, but their their sort of handling of the 
of the systems details, which do have pretty significant knock-on effects for the algorithms that are used, is 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 completely different. I see. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer to your question. I hope it was. Yeah, no worries. So fingers crossed for your resubmission, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thanks a lot for for the lectures, like really cool stuff at the end. Uh, the fact that you can compile the the cipher text just blew my mind, but <laughs> really cool. So to come yeah, back to the actual question. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so when you introduced like the encoding procedure, well, part of it was because you could have like a, you were considering the fact that in practice you may have some non-uniform distributions of um, of right. es essentially what you want to send. My question was first to address that. Would some form of rejection sampling be applicable, do you think, instead of just using the whole encoding decoding procedure? Like, because with the rejection sampling, you could potentially massage uh, your output distribution, right, into something that could be interesting. So that was one idea. And second, I actually wonder if doing whether the encoding procedure or rejection sampling wouldn't somehow um, threaten the security of the scheme in a certain way um, of the encryption. Um, I was wondering, but not completely sure. Okay, so to answer the first question, uh, no. And the reason is because traditional rejection sampling techniques do not allow you to recover the uniform bits with which you're doing the rejection sampling. Correct, yeah. And that was really the hard part, is, is you needed a way to sample from a non-uniform distribution using uniform bits. Lots of ways to do that, but none of them actually give you a way to recover those uniform bits from the sample that you have. As for w uh, what effect it might have on security, I don't, I mean, uh, you know, if you, if you have finite precision arithmetic encoding um, or any of these uh, um, encoding schemes that, that like meet the Shannon bound, but arithmetic encoding is particularly fast and, um, uh, and not too hard to implement. But if you have finite precision, then you lose some of the fidelity in your ability to sample. You're not sampling precisely from the distribution, you're sampling from like a quantized version of it. And the more finite the precision, the more quantization you're going to have. So I suppose with a sufficiently sophisticated test and a sufficiently um, you know, small amount of finite precision in the encoding procedure, you may be able to distinguish if, if you yourself as the adversary have a more accurate model of the real distribution, right? That's also something that's floating around that never really gets addressed, is there's there's the real distribution of say HTTP messages that appear in your target environment. Then there's the distribution that you can create using your FTE system. And then there's the distribution that the adversary has as its model of the real distribution. And it's, it's really these two, not the true distribution, it's really these two that matter. Right? What does the adversary feel like is the correct distribution relative to the distribution you can create? So, and what the adversary's distribution is, that's, I, I have no idea. I mean, we, because, uh, you know, it's perhaps not surprising that it's hard to get censoring regimes to tell us what is the, their distribution of what they expect to see on the wire. So, um, so yeah, yes, potentially, uh, uh, and I guess there potentially could also be like timing attacks, depending on the precision. I'm not entirely sure. That's I'm just speculating that maybe the more bits that you try to encode to the arithmetic encoder, that maybe slight timing differences. I don't know. I haven't considered that at all. Thanks, Phil. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Tom, was there any? Uh, yeah. Follow-up work by you or someone else, perhaps, looking at how the DPI uh, devices reacted to this? Uh, yeah, there was. So, um, not in the crypto world. Um, so there was a there's a paper by it's Vitaly Shmodikov, and I forget who else was on that paper. Um, it's uh, it's referred to as the Paris Dead paper, um, and uh, so I, you know. I like Vitaly. I think Vitaly is great. Anybody, if you know Vitaly, you know he has kind of like an over-the-top, bombastic style to him, which I I really appreciate. And there's a little bit of that in this paper. What this paper basically was was saying was like, um, unless you can 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 mimic uh, in your ciphertext that you output, like the precise behavior of this version of this browser, uh, then you can tell the difference between what you produce 
and a, you know a really precise model of this version of this browser, right? So, um, so this pair of dead paper is basically saying like all these schemes that actually attempt to mimic real world protocols or, or, or real world protocol implementations uh, are, are dead in the water because um, they, they're not going to be able to precisely uh, to mimic all of the features, you know, timing, size, their packet arrival, whatever. Like you're not going to mimic all the features, and so there's always going to be something uh, that we can find that allows us to distinguish. And um, so then um, I had a follow-up paper to that. It was, uh, was myself and my co-authors from the FTE papers, and then some additional students. They basically looked like, okay, but really, really, like how easy is it to tell? Um, and one thing we found, for example, was that the FTE version that was rolled into Tor, uh, which had some like you know some stuff shaved off to make it fast and whatever, uh, that you could actually distinguish from um, uh, from real HTTP messages within some 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 set uh, because uh, by, by running like ent entropy tests, like empirical entropy tests on uh, on the ciphertext that are produced, so. Yeah, there's still, you know, I don't want to give the impression, like, I love giving this talk because it's cool stuff, but I definitely do not want to give the impression that, like, FTE is the answer uh, for censorship circumvention, for example, because there are so many facets to this problem. And this is just providing one way to address, even not in totality, but one way to address a significant chunk of a small piece of this bigger problem. But uh, after our paper, I don't, I don't know what's happened since then. I know that there's been some uh, some work, but I don't know if it's pushed really on FTE, um, either from the development side or from the attack side. 